And uh, our text this morning is about Jesus at 12 years old going to the temple. Now, Tuesday evening, I have the first of this quarter's coaches meetings. And they'll give me a list of my, my roster. I'll get to see what kids I've got. And one couple, a couple kids that I know of uh, is um, uh, one of whom is Justin Estrada. And Justin was injured last quarter, so they're letting him play on this quarter even though he's aged out. And Justin came to me as a 13-year-old boy. And these young ones, the 13-year-olds, come in as these skinny, scared, pencil-necked little boys who are, who are there to play. And then the 15-year-olds are young men. They've grown shoulders and strength, and they have speed, and they're jumping 30 inches off the floor. And that's Justin, that's, uh, that's his brother Justin, but that's Jonathan Estrada now, incredibly fast, great athlete, and he will break away from everyone else for a layup, and then he'll miss the shot. But he's a great... <laughs> A great kid, but it's so wonderful to see them go from boys to men in that very brief span of time. Well, Jesus is about that age. He's a skinny little pencil neck kid. And yet he goes to Jerusalem with his parents and suddenly he's playing in the NBA. He's sitting down and actually instructing the, the scholars of Jerusalem. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers, but when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to find him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious, the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his, answer, his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, Jesus asked. Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and all the people. God added his understanding to this hearing of his word. Well, growing up is tough. And at what point in our lives do we finally realize that we're adults? I think we all know some people who may be full of years, but aren't quite there yet. <laughs> Haven't quite made it into adulthood. And, and it is a it is a challenge that we, that we all face somewhere along the way. And that is, what does it mean to be an adult? Now, when Mary and Joseph took Jesus and the other kids down to Jerusalem, it was Jesus' turn to become a son of the covenant. Not quite a bar mitzvah, but something close to that. He was entering into that place where he was then recognized as a full member of the community. He was considered by that rite of passage an adult, a man. Everything about childhood had been put behind him. There was a rite of passage, a ritual that they would pass through where they would come in one way, one day a child and the other 
on the other side, an adult. And we don't do that anymore. Maybe we should. Maybe it would be healthy if, if, we, if we did that. I've been reading some, some blogs and articles of our millennials, and um, they have a hard time knowing whether or not they're grown up yet. And they don't want to grow up because they, they see adulthood as boring. And that element or that generation, which is so into being non-judgmental, are so judgmental of all of us who are so boring. But um, I read a number of articles. I just called out one comment. If part of adulthood is accepting responsibility and do drudgery, is the bravery part of adulthood holding on anyway to our hope that something good's coming along? As if all of that reality of, of mortgages and car payments and marriage and kids and all of that, as if that is just so awful. And so this was in a larger article about a 22-year-old woman who has been out partying, and she looks at 30-year-olds who are still partying, partying, partying all the time, and just pushing off adulthood as far as they can. And many of them are still living at home with their parents. Well, reality is they grow up sooner or later. Sooner or later, adulthood, um, at least with respect to responsibilities, real life happens to all of us. And that aspect of adulthood that is assuming full responsibility for one's own life then extends out to accepting responsibility for others as well, especially the, the lesson that we have from kids. Because when kids come, they are fully dependent upon us. They need us to feed them and clothe them and drive them around and do all the things that we do as parents and, as, and that they demand of us as kids. And we learn oftentimes just by the realities of the demands of life, what it means to grow up, to be an adult. Somehow I think it would be good if we had some sort of a rite of passage where we would move from one status to another, from one place where we know we're, ch we're children to another place where we've got to begin to take responsibility for ourselves, and others around us. I do have to deal with some parents with basketball. <laughs> because I have to tell them sometimes, you know, you pay for your child to participate, but they earn time on the floor. The cuts come in life. And even though I will play your son just as much as I can, I'm not going to sacrifice those kids who are playing so well and are hauling the freight just for them. And your son may be one who is playing the cello and doing a fabulous job academically, whereas these fine athletes might be fine athletes. But the reality is the cuts come in life. And we all have to find that place, not that we necessarily that we want to do. For a lot of the millennials are talking about, I don't know what to do. I know I have to make money, but I don't know what to do to make money. It's not about doing what we want to do. Because what we do will change over time throughout our years. But it's who are we? Who are we? This was the core reality of Jesus' visit to Jerusalem. And that was an affirmation of who he was, his identity. 
his co the core reality of who he was. So the Passover was this wonderful celebration. They had three celebrations a year, but the Passover is the one that almost everyone went to. And all of Jerusalem was flooded with half a million people, pilgrims from all over the place. But families would look forward to this for weeks because as a big caravan of families, they would go down to Jerusalem, 80 miles from Nazareth down to Jerusalem. And it was kids looking forward to it, and parents, well, they looked forward to it kind of, sort of. They knew how much work it was going to be. Grandparents would come, and it was the entire community, just a wonderful experience of this pilgrimage down to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And these were not somber um, occasions of heavy religiosity. They were, they were fun, they were, uh, there was music and dancing, there was all kinds of getting together. It was like church camp for a full week. And they loved it. And they looked forward to it. And so on this particular occasion, <clears throat> they go to Jerusalem. And is it any surprise at all that as Joseph and Mary and everyone else from Nazareth left, they're going down the road to Jericho, and then they're going to make their way up the Jordan River and then back across to Nazareth. Is it any surprise that by the end of the day, they would look to each other and basically ask, where are the kids? Well, the little ones would be probably with mom or dad, either one. But a 12-year-old, 12, 13-year-old, 12, well, of course, he's got friends. Parental influence is on the decline. It's being eclipsed by the influence of friends. So it was common for young people to hang out with each other on these journeys. But then Joseph didn't know, and Mary didn't know, and we already know who won that argument. Dad's always at fault under these circumstances. But a panic soon sets in after the blaming ends, and they ask throughout the community of travelers together, and nobody knows where Jesus is. Joseph and Mary go back to Jerusalem. They're looking everywhere, everywhere they can think to look. After three days, they look in the temple. And Jesus greets them with, and of course, mom scolds him. Where have you been? We have been so worried about you. I mean, you, you know, you've heard yourself say, <laughs> we have been frantic looking for you. And Jesus simply says, why would you think I'd be any place else? This is how you raised me. Of course I'm here. You have brought me up in such a way that I would be here. And I'm here about my father's business. I'm here to, to learn even more about my relationship with my father. This is, these are the first recorded words of Jesus. And even at that tender age, he is affirming his identity. He is a son, the son of God. He's affirming his identity as the son of God. And this is a, a word that, and a phrase that I'm not sure Mary and Joseph understood it all, but they, they take their son and they, they go back home. And it says that Jesus grew in stature and in maturity. So it means that Jesus not only grew as a, as a man, but he grew in wisdom. He became mature. And, and isn't that really what growing up is all about. It's not about chronological age. It's about maturity. It's about entering into a sense of what it means to be 
a functioning adult within the community, but even more of that, more than that, it means affirming a, particularly, a particular identity that, it's, that is ours as a child of God. Because therein is the real source of our maturity. For it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be this in my life and I'm going to do these things in my life and I'm going to amass these things and I'm going to do all that stuff. It's another thing altogether to say, I belong to God. And somehow, some way, following the calling that God has given me, the claim that God has on my life, that's why I'm here. Whether it's in medicine or law, whether it's fixing air conditioners or working on brakes on cars, I'm going to follow the Lord's leading wherever I am. And in that way, in that way, we move into a place of real maturity because that's what it's all about. For really it's about in this life, don't we all want to finish well? Don't we all want to know that when that day comes, when our eyes are closing for the last time, that we have done what God has called us to do? Don't we want to finish well? The Apostle Paul in the closing chapters of, to the church of Ephesus makes a comment that gives them a sense of what it means to, to finish well. But until that time, he says, okay, if you're a thief, stop stealing. Clean up your language. Start doing stuff that is right and quit doing stuff that's wrong. Real basic fundamental stuff that we all know. But what about that end season? What about those closing days when we know we're at a place to finish well? My father played basketball. He was at Gonzaga, graduated in 1939. And we would all make fun of him because his hands were all gnarled, because all of his fingers had been so many times jammed by a basketball. And so we would joke with dad about his hands. And, and it was uh, all part of the fun of family. <clears throat> and dad had a great sense of humor. He took it well. Dad was also a civil engineer, kind of gruff at times. And, um, and I watched dad in the closing years of his life. When he would come home after, because he was working at the church handing out bulletins, but he would come home after church and bring that prayer list with him. And he'd take the prayer list and take it on his walk. He would walk for about an hour every day, even in the closing days of his life. But he would take that list and I watched him and he'd walk and then he'd look at it and then he'd walk some more. He would pray through the church's prayer list every day. And then in the last couple of visits that I had before dad died at 96, in the evening, I remember turning the corner and looking at dad in the living room and seeing those gnarled hands closed in prayer. And he couldn't even close his hands all the way because of his fingers. And I thought, this is not the dad I know. This is not the man that I argued with when he was so wrong and I was 15 and so right. <laughs> and he was praying until the end. And on that night that he finally went home to the Lord, he was making his way up the steps. My sister was walking behind to make sure he didn't fall. 
And dad went to his bedside. And like a little boy, every night he would kneel at the bedside and pray. And on that particular night, dad knelt down, went forward to pray, and was gone. That we would be mature means that we would be in relationship with our God. We are not the Son of God, but we are all children of God. And therein, in, in seizing upon that as our core identity, whatever it is we do with respect to the activities of our life, if we are living in and for our Christ. We are living in and for the high calling to which we've been called and know in our actual experience the deepest, most profound joys of what this life can offer us. And so Jesus, of course, said to his parents, where else would you find me? Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, whatever our activities, may we always be found with you. For you are in us. We are your children. And we are those who are growing up into the image and likeness of your Son. Until that day, O oh Lord, by the power of your work within us, may we, in what ways we might, as your children, be like him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.